So I'm Ian Fazell, I'm a child psychiatrist. I do research at the University of Oxford and I'm really interested in how to improve and develop services, mental health services uh, for vulnerable populations in particular. So I was invited by PSN, Presbyterian Support North, to come and share some of the policy and practice opportunities there are for developing school mental health. So what I've tried to do in the presentation is to think about children and adolescents and the important tasks they have to achieve. And it's a really complicated period of development. There's so much learning that they have to do, not only cognitively and educationally, but behaviorally, emotionally, peer raise, in family relationships. Like, there's a lot of tasks that adolescents in particular need to complete. And um, this also is a time where major mental illness starts. So it's so prominent. Um, this is kind of the, the period in life where you're most susceptible for developing a mental illness. So I think the work I do is really focusing on how can we support people at this age best. And all of the thinking and um, interests of mine has led to the school environment being so important. Like how do we as mental health services in particular in, integrate ourselves better with what's happening at schools because schools are where children are. They're spending most of their time at school. So why aren't we as mental health professionals working more closely within that context? Yeah, so I think the school environment you need to think of in, as many different components. There's school leadership and actually having school leadership thinking that mental illness is important and mental health support as key is a major um, contributor to successful mental health policies in a school. But there are also teachers at schools and teachers are under increasing pressure. They're not necessarily trained to manage the range of emotional behavioral difficulties that walk into the classroom. And what we know is that as teacher stress levels get higher, actually children's stress levels seem to mirror that. And so anything we can do to prevent and uh, teachers uh, experiencing what's called the burnout cascade would be important that a stressed teacher has more stressed children in the classroom who might have more behavioral challenges present that makes that teacher feel even more stressed and that cascade is just really difficult for any teacher to manage and so what support can be done to train teachers better to provide ongoing systems to facilitate them I think is really important the other thing that's increasingly obvious is everything about bullying. No, no component of bullying is good for mental health. And actually it has a lifelong negative impact on a young person to be bullied at school in particular. And so schools really need to take intervening with bullying seriously because it's gonna have major mental health implications. And there's a lot of learning now about what schools can do on many different levels to have a whole culture that is kind of protecting children against the worst components of bullying and preventing it. I think it's useful to think about three different types of interventions in schools. One is what we call mental health promotion, which is something that's done for all children. It improves kind of social emotional learning programs that fall within that, anti-bullying campaigns fall within that. So these are kind of universal interventions to promote mental well-being. And these have a very good evidence base that um, schools that have these programs have better ed educational outcomes as well as emotional behavioral outcomes. So there are good educational reasons to engage with these programs. Then there's the whole prevention of mental illness component, which is trying to find those that are more likely to develop mental health problems and prevent them developing them in the long run. And a whole host of different interventions have been tried to prevent depression, anxiety, the post-traumatic stress disorder um, and I think the learning from these programs is less clear. Um, it's clearly an important area we need to develop and given the number of schools and the number of children at schools we should be really focusing on a more robust evidence base for these programs but right now there might be some evidence to prevent depression, some um, programs that might prevent low, you know, suicidal ideation and actions but very, very few. And then there's what we call the indicated programs, those that treat children that have disorders like depression. And those also have a relatively good evidence base. So we know how to treat depression in clinics. And a lot of those principles do translate well into school contexts. The important ways to try and drive these initiatives, I think the first step is to not see schools as isolated 
institutions. They're part of a big system. You know, children, families, communities, peers, schools, all of these are big systems that interact together. And so it's important to think like for schools to do interventions that might be that they're supporting families, that actually that might be the most important way that a school can work. But then actually very few schools are supported in developing family programs. And so finding ways for social care, for mental health services to come in and work in a more collaborative manner is I think the first and most important step to take, which is that these aren't isolated problems and these aren't, shouldn't be isolated institutions. But what you find in countries around the world is that these institutions that decide about these things are very separate. The ministries of Health and Ministries of Education are often quite distinct ministries. Yet from a child's perspective, you know, it doesn't really matter which ministry is dealing with them. They've got needs in their environment and we need to find a more integrative and coherent way to manage it.